Okay, usually the four movies, and I have a two distinct uh, divisions. Either it's by a force or an entity. Mm. So like Halloween, it, that's completely a force, right? Yeah. I would say Michael Myers is just an absolute force. Yeah, at least in the first movie. And then with <laughs> like something like Poltergeist, it's an entity. Mm. It's a it's ghost, right? But here, I think it's a balance of force and an entity. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we've got like a merging of that. And, and perhaps the most shocking thing about the film is that we don't have a yelling George... Scott. No, he's actually pretty re reserved, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So today on Kyle and Nick on film, we're breaking up uh, the the more reserved George C. Scott, working with his wife. Trisha yeah, his wife is in this on uh, the underrated uh, Canadian Very production, underrated. The Changeling. All right, welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Goethe from Goat Film Reviews. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast, and thanks again for watching, and thanks for finding us if you're new. And for the loyal listeners who continue, and the watchers who continue to watch us, we thank you for your support. Today we're going to continue talking about horror movies, and we're talking about one from 1980 that it's not a slasher movie, can you believe it? No. Uh, and preludes uh, Poltergeist, The Changeling. Exactly, yes. Yeah, so the Changeling uh, is about, after suffering a terrible loss, music professor John Russell moves to Seattle to start anew, mm -hmm. renting out an old mansion in Chessman Park. Soon after arriving, John begins hearing noises in the night and an unsettling presence within the house walls. Yes. As he uncovers the house's past, he discovers a horrifying secret that cannot and will not stay buried. This is the first time I've ever actually seen this from beginning to end. I've seen snippets of, you know, slices of it. Mm -hmm. I actually remember the, the that bathtub scene. Okay. Because as kids, we're always like, somebody's going to grab your feet. Yeah. <laughs> so it's always that notion. Now I go, now I get the reference why we always talk about this. Mm -hmm. uh, Changeling with George C. Scott. And see, that's where my in is, is that I kind of, as a child... I wasn't sure which George C. Scott horror movie was on TV when I saw him, like on the sci-fi channel, because sometimes it was The Changeling and sometimes it was The Exorcist 3. Uh -huh. And I'm a proponent. I think The Exorcist 3 is the best Exorcist This movie is actually his audition, audition tape. Yeah, yeah so, this is so I, I confused the two, and actually, um, as I grew older and started to realize right. that there were two different films, like I was like, i got to hunt down The Changeling, and it just always passed by on my list of to-watch movies. It was always there and just never got watched until today. So, definitely a mood. I love the cinematography mm. of this. It did win a couple of awards for cinematography up in Canada. Yep. Uh, uh, something John, uh, what's his name? John Co John Coquillon? Oh, get it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I will go on to do other accomplished films. But the trickery stuff of it is when you get that when you get to do good stuff with cinematography is doing a ghost movie where you have somebody just throw down a ball and you can just set up the camera and like, Ooh, be haunting that way. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. tough part there isn't the cinematography, it's rolling the ball down and getting it in like, right, getting it in the right framing. <laughs> so it's, it's more or less having fun mm -hmm. filming a movie with cinema, because you can do a lot of things with cinematography, like you can raise the crane up to show the chandelier and mm -hmm. the chandelier shake. So you have to do a little bit of timing as well when you do these kind of movies, especially when you do a haunted house and you don't really see anything, but it's a lot of the atmosphere. Yeah, the atmosphere is killer in this movie, and especially when you consider the, the amount of scope that's being put on a traditional haunted house kind of a story. Right. Um, this is Peter Medak who directed this film, who also did Romeo is Bleeding, yes. um, as well as what I think is the best species movie, Species 2. Um, but also... You know, <laughs> Out of those, right. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, Medak, this is kind of an early film from him, and so to have the kind of scope of those really sweeping shots, and we have to remember that... That house is not actually there when we do the outside shots of the house. Like that was a, that was a built structure made for the the film. Oh, the exterior. Exist. The exterior is not in existence. So the fact that it looks so good in some of those opening shots, the exterior of the That's house, very clever. is pretty pretty amazing stuff. That's very clever. Uh, once again, we were talking about uh, George Sicard. Uh, actually, his wife was mm -hmm. in the movie. Uh, Trista, uh, Trish Vandeveer. They did eight Vandeveer. films together, I believe. Yes, eight eight films together, mm -hmm. um, and she plays this very reserved, but also has the right moments. Obviously, know how to work together. Yeah, which is I know a lot of people that are actors, actresses that are married that will never work together. But obviously, they like working together. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's it's funny because I don't want to sound mean to George C. Scott, but he 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 looks like he's up there in age right now, and she looks fairly young. And I was like, oh, they're doing one of these old guy and like young lady movies where they're kind of having a will they won't they thing. Yeah. And then to find out they're married, I was like, well, now I feel bad. So, <laughs> but yeah, they do have the definite chemistry. Um, I like that it's not a full-on romantic engagement there's no. more just kind of like uh friction yeah like like an emotional friction where they feel something but he's recovering from the loss of, of his you know wife and daughter so there's not like a full-on like forced 
Romanticism. Actually, that beginning of that telephone booth, and well, not the booth, but the whole that whole scene actually shot was pretty well. It's very, it's very shot well shot. Good. The only problem is that I, I don't know. I, I'm not in Canada that often, so I don't know how often they actually had just a lone telephone booth on the side of the <laughs> road because <laughs> it felt like that might have been forced in there. But yeah, yeah it's a very well done uh, sequence. If you yeah, don't know how the film opens, it's a staggering opening because it just kind of oh, catches yeah. you off guard. I literally only know about it because. I watched In Search of Darkness when I was not feeling well a couple weeks ago, and they talked about the opening so much. It's a good opening, right? Yeah. It's one of those like uh, phenomena. It's mm -hmm. good openings. Um, and then that's what the thing it gets bright, and then the tones get right with the house. It's not mm -hmm. really, it doesn't really look, it doesn't look clean. It looks like somebody didn't really clean it, but it looks magnificent to live in. Yeah. So it's like that play of like, oh, there's something really off going mm -hmm. on. Yes. And it's great knowing, again, knowing that this house was built. Like, the interior of the house was built on a soundstage. Like, this is not, like, on location shooting in no. this house. It was on a soundstage. And for this house to have the kind of mood and atmosphere that the internalized house has, it reminded me a lot of Burnt Offerings um, from a similar time period where that, like, the, the house just feels like its own character. And it doesn't just feel like yeah. a character is a haunted house. It feels like this haunted house. Right. Yeah, we always talk about that some, sometimes environments can be a good, effective character in a story. Psycho does that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, now you have a good, some, some good stunts. Uh, not even the stunts of the burning stairwell, but you have a stunts of even uh, the dirt, the, yep. me, the medallion. So, and then you got an ex machia music box. But mm -hmm. wonderful special effects are in this one too. Yeah, it's, it's clear looking at it 41 years later, like you can see kind of how it was done. Oh but yeah, a little, kind of, take the little shoes, the little yeah. fish net, and pull them. But this there. is a case of pulling back the curtain, where it still feels just as effective, knowing how the magician does his trick. Yeah. Like it's noticeable, but it doesn't take away from the film noticeable. I agree. Yeah, yeah. and um, make sure Joshi Scott stands in a well for a couple shots. But that is lit really well. Again, that is yeah, another yeah. one that's lit really well. It's a cool set piece because so often, are you ever going to really get a, a well inside of a house sequence where the house is actually normal? Like usually, you think of like the ring. Where they go into, you know, she goes into the well, like, and it's in this broken down shack. But, like, this is like a normal, very comfortable home that just happens to have a partial haunting connected to it. Yes. <laughs> One of the things that kind of is slightly comical is George C. Scott doesn't really play piano in this. So, the, the shots of, you know, of him playing the piano, so mm -hmm. it does look kind of look quirky now. Mm. And it doesn't really seem an emphasis, but it's the driving force of why music played a part in this movie. You always talk about films, 50% of film is sound. Yep. And this is the trinkets of sound being incorporated into the driving force of the story. And it's funny because I don't, I don't actually feel like I noticed it from the playing of the music mm -mm. as much as I did from his reaction. He feels like he's very into the music, like, and he's kind of like drifting back, and he's closing his eyes, and he's feeling the the emotion and the momentum coming, and I kind of felt like he's feeling it a little early here. Like, I'm not judging his music performance, but he's oh. feeling a bit early on the like the yeah. emotional connection to it. But yeah, it's you know, it's one of those things if you can learn it, do so because it will aid your performance. But I also think you can work around that a little bit, you know. Yeah. So George C. Scott does have a really phenomenal performance. It's not going to get probably Oscar nominated because it's a horror movie but nowadays I think it's almost like a Tony Tony Collette in Heredity mm -hmm. it's a really good performance in this movie in a horror movie um, talking about real it's a ghost story but it really is what you're resolving your themes and your uh, uh, problems of your own past as well yeah well, what I wish though is I wish that the film kept with that emotional trauma piece as strong in the second half as it does in the first half he's yeah, very much struggling there. through that and it's okay to see him growing, but we don't really get the idea that he's growing, and we get more the idea that the, the that part of the story is just disappearing in favor of this mystery and this ghost story. It does slightly, I would have liked yeah. if we had kind of had a denouement that came back to that a little bit more, and at least right. let us know like the transition that it was. Um, the funny thing for me was looking at it, I actually felt that the you know looking at the two halves, the ghost story and the mystery, if you will, I found myself yeah. really enthralled in the mystery, way yeah. more than the ghost story portion of it. And that's not usually my way. I usually swing in the. We have to do you that. Know? Yeah, you have to do the hauntings right. I mm -hmm. think they do enough of them and tease you a little bit to make it not the overall emphasis. If yeah. you do, if you really go heavy handed with ghosts and was like thirteen ghosts and stuff like that, you're going to play yourself in a corner that you can't get out. But if you tease a little bit and have a driving force, a little bit of mystery and a kernel of investigation, it yeah. plays well. There's a great scene of the wheelchair on the on the steps. Yeah. And for anybody, it, it's just a wheelchair on the steps. But how they shot it and the reactions to them 
Mm. Sell the movie. Yeah, that slight adjustment it makes that's sitting there where you're just kind of <laughs> taken aback by it. That's, um, well, this is the greatest empty chair horror movie you could see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Nowhere has a non-chair been used better than Evil Dead in this film. <laughs> that little yeah. rickety movement right there. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think what's funny about it is that looking at this film, and as I was watching it, I was like, okay, it's 1980. You yeah. know, haunted house movies, they existed before this, but like, you know, they haven't, I don't think they've existed to this extent until no. after this film. So watching it and you hear the banging on the walls and the ball rolling down the, the staircase, these all feel like very tropey, very, you know, simply put together. What I really admire about the film is how those things actually mattered to the, the behind the scenes mystery. Like yeah. those pieces actually meant something that banging on the walls was more important when you uncover the mystery. Yeah. Uh, and then it ended up being when I was watching, it was like, oh, we're having the banging on the walls thing. Like, right. Okay, the, the, cool. the, the but then when it meant something, it actually meant something to me. So. Yeah, it's like on the, like the house on Haunted Hill. Yeah, and I was thinking about the, the yeah. haunting from 1963, was it? Where like that is the entire movie is banging on the walls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you like you said, emphasis is how you put it in the story mm -hmm. drives it because it's it's a trope that's constantly used, but you put a little spin on it, it makes it more more interesting. I love the journey of it. I love like okay, you're doing the cliches, but it's a play on the cliches, mm -hmm. and I like that. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I've seen criticism that he, he figures out the mystery and unravels it a little too easily. I didn't really think that that was the case. At least I didn't think that it was too many leaps in judgment. Maybe his acceptance of the ghostliness of his home yeah. happens a bit uneven, but I don't think it's out. I don't think it ever took me out of the movie. Right, you know? and I would I would say that the script is definitely not a polished script. There are some mm -hmm. rough patches to this. Um, and right, and talking about the dissolving of his own past, and now he's going to be investigate what the, why my house is haunted, and I'm just going to abandon this and then research that. So there's a lot of little beat changes that don't really mesh together. But overall, it's a fantastic movie to watch. Oh yeah, I was I was taken in the entire time. Uh, what I yeah, I, I just find it very admirable that it's focusing on all these different things. And like I said, it struggles a bit with yeah. that, but it juggles the ghost story mystery because I do think those are two halves of the story. Like the ghost story like amps up the tension amps up the the like like emotional resonance but then it also knows okay he's starting to get into the, into the mystery part of the story we can back off now and it, it really yeah. does in that way backs off a little bit and then it has a full tilt like pretty you know exciting climax as well oh gosh yes mm -hmm. so when you build a set and you know it's almost like you kill your darlings in your script. Well, when you build a beautiful set, you, you're going to have to wreck that too, right? <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to destroy it. And of course, they're going to destroy it. Is it check off set piece? Or... <laughs> you heard it's a nice, dirty house. Right. Yeah. So, and it's a wonderfully shot film. Mm -hmm. it is one of the, it's one of those that I think if it wasn't a horror movie, it'd probably get some recognition for it, even the cinematography and the set design. Yeah, perhaps the film... Uh, I think it's sold as a bit more of a horror story than it is. If you look at that poster, that poster yeah. is creepy as hell. And I would say so. And I think the film is a little bit more restrained. Yeah. There's there's some disturbing elements there, but at the same time, I, I was surprised to find that the film was rated R, to be honest. Well, yeah. You know, I, I think there, there's so little blood in it. There's so little of anything else. I suppose right. when, you, when you have some of the darker subject material, the mysteries unraveling, yeah. I could see, I guess, why they lean toward it, because we didn't have a PG-13 at the time. So. Because you're authentically selling what is kind of silly. A ball going down the steps. You're like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's silly. Or a wheelchair on the, you know, up there. And that's all by itself can be not really frightening. But they sell it really good to enough to like, I think this is traumatic to watch. Yeah, like other films that we've watched where we, we kind of see the horror does not rise to the level of the performers. This is not the case. The horror reaches reaches the level of the performance. And again, like, like you said, it was a great starting point for George C. Scott's evolution into The Exorcist 3. So I really do think like <laughs> yeah. we may not have The Exorcist 3 with George C. Scott if we didn't have the changeling. No, and I don't think we would even point. have Poltergeist. Yeah, that's true too. I think, I think both films owe a lot to that resonance that comes through. The not film is also... Yeah. Notable as being one of Martin Scorsese's like top eleven, he has eleven scariest horror films of all time. Nev Campbell, star of Scream, uh, she says it's the scariest movie she's ever seen. So it's it's got that part where it's it's been a part of you know influencing other people, changing people's mindsets on it too. Is that enticing that I'm going to get back at you, but you are going to want to? Mm -hmm. It's almost like even though he's getting to, it's maybe a little bit of a revenge story. But overall, we like, how is this going to conclude? And no matter what you're going to do, the ending is the result, no matter what. No matter what the character Yeah, no matter which choice you make, that this film will end 
the same way. It just may take a different turn to get there. And I think that's that's maybe the most tragic part of it is as we peel back layers, we learn that even even our villains may not have been knowingly or willingly participants. Villains. Right. Yeah, like they're they're kind of just caught in and it feels very Shakespearean in that way and that most of the time in his tragedies, you know, the the, the bad guys don't ever win, yeah. but the good guys don't win either. No one really comes out of it unscathed. Yeah. So it's it's wonderful dressing because even going to the uh, going to the attic, it looks authentically doesn't really look manufactured dirty. It really looks like it's authentically dirty out there. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. really look like oh we just throw the dust in special effects. They really did a fantastic job to make it really, really looking authentic. Old. Yeah, it's it's a sh weird that uh, production designer Trevor Williams, who did the you know all the work on the film here, yeah. it's weird that he mostly focused on comedies after this. Uh, he did you know a bunch of the Police Academy movies. He did Revenge of the Nerds too. Like, yeah, you know, like it's interesting to me That's because weird. I think the production design is so so good. It is. You know, if, if there's one thing to take out of the film, I would even say stronger than the cinematography or the editing or the music is the the production design. This film makes it well. Live, it makes yeah. cinematography easy, right? Yeah, because you have so many options, and especially when you build a set, you have so many options of where you want to put the camera and how you can do all your crane shots inside mm -hmm. the rooms. And but stuff. to have the have the house feel when you do that, when you build a set, sure, it might make the you know, the ability as a cinematographer a little bit more maneuverable. Yeah. It also makes the production design so much more difficult because it has to feel lived in, especially here where you have, I think the, they said it was last lived in in 1907, 08, and this is yeah, 80. Yeah, so it's, yeah. been, it's been seven decades at least since this home had a, a lived in resident. You've got to make it feel that way. Uh, and I definitely said it could have gone silly. Mm -hmm. Especially with the cliches of like music and the swinging chandelier and a seance and all that stuff, you're like, oh my god, we've seen this before. Mm -hmm. But it's crafted enough to make it drive the story, yeah, and sell it really well. Yeah, the yeah. seance is an area but where could have gone it bad. That, bad. Yeah, but yeah, I was I was not prepping for the seance to work well for me, like for my engagement. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But I can see yeah, that it's about. it's a very emotional film. <laughs> um, but I can see how that that sequence in particular really could have gone the seance sequence of Insidious. Yeah, like it's very much the same kind of feeling where they're doing some kookier things, but it never it never goes, left to that yeah. kind of serious level. Yeah. yeah, it never really goes over to the ridiculous yeah. or over the top exaggeration. It does enough to kind of almost clip its wings mm -hmm. and keep it just drive it here. This is the mystery. This is the little in, little kernels at a time to keep you occupied. And the scares don't really start right away. It, it's like slow little things. Yeah, yeah, it's it's almost you know. It's almost just chipping away at you. It never, yeah. there's no jump. I like that too. Yeah. Like, it's a moody piece. I don't think at any point I felt like, gonna pull up the cover scared, but I just felt the ambience, it, it, yeah. and the mood, and the feeling of what was going on. I was, and using that, I was able to ex access um, John Russell's character. You know, I understood what he was feeling because it felt weird. It felt yeah. off. Yeah, because you feel it almost inside you that mm -hmm. this is like, this is not right. The entire movie, everything yeah. is going. This is not right. And even when it's calm and relaxed, it's still, this is not right. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Throughout the, everything. Until the end of the movie, you're like, even when things are going wrong, you're like, well, there's some kind of resolution to this. Make it, maybe it make everybody better. Yep. yep. Even so, though it's awful, what's going the, the third act. Yeah. yeah, and again, like, I think that's the understanding of the third act is, again, that that this this wasn't the, the climax we wanted. It wasn't mm -hmm. the one John wanted. It wasn't the one the ghosts. I mean, the ghosts really don't get what they want either. They no. get a semblance of it. But it's almost like the ghost has the, the biggest uh, uh, character turn in the whole film is because they realize that I still don't feel any different. <laughs> no, you right. Know. Yeah. That, and then it's, it's a little bit of, that has a 70s flavor still into it. Oh, yeah, there's definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even though it's kind of considered an 80s horror, I, I think it's a little bit of more of a 70s horror movie than an 80s. When so. I think, I think... If I'm correct, I think there was a lot more 70s Canadian horror directors coming up about that mm -hmm. time. I always think about Cronenberg, but there was a lot more than him. There was some more like Canadian horror taking place in the 70s. It and sure maybe that's was. why this film feels a little bit more towards that, is even though it's set in Seattle, it's got that Canadian style to it that has a Canadian crew to it, has Canadian people working in the background still. So it does kind of have a semblance of what we would see later on in more television horror yeah. in the 2000s, which is that nice, you know, kind of semblance of we don't have to throw the blood at your face, like in America. 
So one of the little colonels, I'll give you a little fun fact about George C. Scott is he had a secret favorite brand of cigarettes he would always conceal. He will never show his brand of cigarettes, so he's always mm. hide them. Even when he's on TV with Johnny Carson, he will almost like, like this. Mm. So I'm sure, yeah, watching this movie, I'm sure even when he was on set, he would never, it was like, it's a secret brand that nobody could really get. It's hard to find, and I don't want to share it with everybody. So mm. he's very well known to guard the brand of cigarettes he liked, and I'm sure he did this in the movie as well. Because I was trying to find what kind of, what is it, what is it? Yeah, I always thought that was like just a visual tick from him. You know, something weird. He was, like, I never really figured out why he did that. But yeah, it's true. He kind of gets this, like, nervous thing where he just looks like, yeah. you know, like, and he, it never looked normal anytime no. he did it. So I, it's, you know, it's something you don't want to call out because you're not sure why he's doing it's it. It's like, like your favorite coffee. You don't want to tell anybody because it might, you know, it ruins secret. Yeah. 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 I don't want anyone else to have them. It's a very famous it's a Minnesota gig, too. Where do you fish at? Oh, you make up a lake name. Yeah. I go over there. Yeah, You never really tell anybody. The lake where... probably exists, too, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, there you go. You have a fun fact. I'm going to drop one as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a Lamberto Bava film called Until Death. Now, I'm a big fan of Lamberto Bava, who did Demons and Demons 2. I enjoy the heck out of both those yeah, films. Yeah, I think you find those um, on Shutter, right? Yep, exactly. And Until Death was marketed... As Changeling 2 in 1988 when it came out um, has nothing to do with the film at all but it was marketed as Changeling oh, just 2, like Troll 2 just like yeah like yeah. so many other films like yeah. Zombie 2 and like you know all these other films that kind of came out where they like if, if you get a chance look up the Evil Dead La Casa sequels because they basically just other countries would throw films in as an Evil Dead sequel and just call it La Casa 7 um, that was that's I think was so weird here so I looked up Until Death afterwards I'm like no connection whatsoever. It's not even mild that connected. Either. Not even you know, it just let's, let's hopefully have some interest of people recognize that movie and just come over. Here. But you know what's funny is yeah. learning that fact made me go, I should watch Until Death. So I guess <laughs> it won me over. So, hey, <laughs> right. okay. Uh, I know this is a, a lot of people regard this as one of the best horror movies. I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of you out there have seen it as well. And if you haven't, please go watch the movie yeah. and kind of, um, and definitely drop a comment down below if you like the Changeling. Yeah, exactly. We both seem to have enjoyed it. Um, okay. So we want to know your thoughts as well. What did you like about it? And also, what's importantly, what did you not like about it? They, there are, it's there's, a little there's rough. plenty of things that you can, that you can yeah. dislike and like. I was more mixed by the last half than I was by the first half, even though I liked the mystery part. So like, you can kind of have that like middle ground area, and we want to know what your thoughts are on that. Um, as Nick pointed out as well, don't forget to like, subscribe, check out that Patreon down below. Yeah. We've got plenty of patrons uh, slots that we can we can give up, and then you can help us pick different films for our Patreon selections. Yeah. We part also get exclusive content uh, and, and lots of interesting posts. I write a lot of stuff on that on that Patreon uh, account, just stuff, got, my yes, thoughts yes, about he, it. Yes, he does. So yeah. uh, please read them so I don't have to keep writing <laughs> uh, like that. But no, uh, definitely thanks for joining us today, guys, and you can check out all my film reviews on GoFilmReviews.com. You can follow the show on Instagram and Twitter as well, and you can check out my podcast, the St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere you find podcasts. All right, until next time, we're just going to go check out some weird stuff in our attics. Yeah.